Welcome back to Math for Game Developers, where we're going to be doing something a little bit different today. It's going to be actually more like physics for game developers, because we are going to study this thing, which is a capacitor. Capacitor. Now, why are we going to study a capacitor where this is like an ele electrical engineering physics sort of thing when this is math for game developers and coding for game developers? And the reason is we're continuing our series on optimization and capacitors are what is used to store all of the data inside our computer or maybe not capacitors, but things that are similar enough ca to capacitors that we can just focus on capacitors here. So all of the data in our computer is stored using these capacitors. So maybe if we learn a little bit about how they work, then we can get some insight into how to optimize our programs. So a capacitor is two metal plates, which are conductive, made of some highly conductive material, maybe copper or something like that. And they're separated by a space which is not conductive at all. And so no electricity can flow no electrons can flow between the space between these two metal plates. And that's a capacitor. And it's called a capacitor because it has the capacity to store electrons, or more interestingly for us, to store data. And here's how it works. There are electrons here on this copper wire. And the electrical engineer who's building this system puts a huge negative um, potential on this end of the electric wire and a huge positive potential electric potential uh, in, another, in other words a positive charge and a negative charge on the other end of this wire and electrons which are negatively charged they repel other negative charges and so if there's a gigantic negative charge here all the electrons are going to go this way and they're going to go down into the capacitor and this plate of the capacitor will get completely filled with electrons but since none of the electrons can pass through this gap, because the gap does not conduct electricity, then they just get stuck here in this plate. And then any of the electrons that were in on the other side get pushed away because they, they hate all these electrons on the other side of the plate. There's too much negative charge there. And so they get pushed out and towards the positive charge that they like. So if our capacitor is full of electrons, that means to the computer that the value stored in this capacitor is one. And if there are no electrons, then that means that the capacitor stored in this, I'm sorry, the value stored in this capacitor is zero. And this is the sort of thing that's used to store all information. It's just a big series of capacitors that are either zeros or ones. So why is this important to us? Let's look a little bit farther on on this wire and we'll see that there's something called a, I'm going to draw it properly, a resistor. And when the computer needs to read whether or not there are electrons in here, or in other words, whether or not there is a one or a zero, then all these electrons need to come back out of this capacitor. But the resistor, it's actually kind of like in this picture, the resistor makes it hard for the electrons to move out of the capacitor. And so it takes time for the electrons to get out. So I'm going to draw a graph here that will give us an indication how much time it will take. Okay, and it kind of looks like this. This is how many electrons have escaped the capacitor, and this is time. So it's not immediate. It takes time for the electrons to get through the resistor and out of the capacitor. And until they get out, we cannot read the data in the capacitor. So it seems like um, the computer is doing things at immediate light speed, but really it takes time. And then this problem becomes worse when you have a bunch of these. Uh, capacitors are assembled to, con to, to create circuits, logic circuits. And you have a series of logic circuits that do whatever it is the processor designer needs to do. And so your data has to travel through these logic circuits in order to get anywhere. This is a very simplified picture of what's going on, but 
there may be a lot of these logic circuits between one place and another in the computer, and they all take this amount of time before they can be read, so to speak. So what computer engineers have done is they've created faster memory that's more expensive and slower memory that's less expensive. Since the faster memory is more expensive, you can only have so much of it, and this, but the slower memory is less expensive, so you can have a bunch of it. And that creates what's called the memory hierarchy. Memory, how do you spell hierarchy? I think this is it, hierarchy. Is it I before E or E before I? Oh my God, English. So we have the memory hierarchy, where memory that's closer to the processor is faster, and memory that's farther away from the processor is slower. And I'm going to go through each one of those types of memory just so that we can see how they work and what they are. Absolutely closest to the processor is the registers. And if we want to look at the speed, the speed of each type of memory, then the registers are going to be on the order of a nanosecond to access them, about a nanosecond. That is blisteringly, bleedingly fast. That's about how long it takes all these electrons to get out of the capacitor. So the registers are what a very small amount of memory that the processor uses directly um, when it's working on any particular part of the program. And then just below the registers, you have a cache. In fact, you have a lot of caches. And the most important ones are the L1 cache and the L2 cache. That's the level one cache and the level two cache. The level one cache is closest to the processor and fastest. And the level two cache is a little farther away and a little bit slower. But they both work on the order of about 10 nanoseconds. So there's a lot more L1 and L2 cache than there is um, than there are registers, but they're a little bit slower. Next down from the cache, you have main memory. Main memory. Okay, and this is the first thing that, you're, that you may be familiar with. It's what you install in a computer if you go build a computer. This is what they're talking about when, you, when they say a computer has two gigabytes of RAM. This is, this is also called RAM, random access memory. And it's on the order of about 100 nanoseconds to access. You may be saying 100 nanoseconds, that's fast, man, if, and which is true. If you were to give me two beeps that were 100 nanoseconds apart, that's too fast for me to register the fact that, were, that they're two beeps. They would just sound like one beep to me because 100 nanoseconds is such a small amount of time. So it's true that that's a, a, a very small amount of time, but compare it to one nanosecond. If you have to go out to main memory for every single instruction that the processor does, then you're going 100 times slower, times slower. And that, that is bad, that is bad. That means our programs are running 100 times slower. So we always want our data to be regi um, resident in the registers if that is possible. Below the main memory, we have the hard drive, hard disk drive, or we can think of this as swap. Sometimes there's not enough space in our main memory for, the th the, for our working uh, program. And so the operating system takes our memory and moves it out to the hard drive, which is even slower. It's a thousand nanoseconds to maybe even 10,000 nanoseconds, which is about one millisecond to 10 milliseconds. So that's another order of magnitude slower. And then below that we may have uh, optical drives like optical drives like CDs uh, that the Xbox uses to load from or you may have network drives, networks. So we may be downloading um, information over a network and that's, even, that's another order of magnitude slower, 100 milliseconds to maybe even a whole second in order to get data. So when we're writing programs, our data could be anywhere in this hierarchy. And it's really important for us to know where our data is because the difference between 
a millisecond and a nanosecond is astronomical, especially if you have to wait a millisecond for every single instruction in your program, then your program's gonna go a thousand times slower. So in the next video, we're gonna start examining how we can exploit the memory hierarchy to make our programs faster. I'll see you next time.